Hello again, everyone. I'm Jason. When I was in Kyrgyzstan, I was having one of those conversations you have on a rest day. We were talking about teaching and mentoring, and the knots we think of as the foundational knots of climbing. I definitely brought up the Munter Hitch. It's one of those knots that maybe if you are a boulderer or a single pitch sport climber focused on the most difficult moves, you may not use that often. But in most other environments, and even if something goes wrong in a single pitch situation, it becomes incredibly useful to know how to employ for different purposes, even if it wouldn't be our first choice. It is often not our first choice because every application of the munter will twist the rope, so we need to be conscious of that ever-present downside. But there are times that can be mitigated, and times the other upsides make it a good choice. So just like we did a previous video that was a deep dive into the proper use, improper use, and myths around the flat overhand bend, most commonly used to join two ropes for a double strand rappel, today we are going deep on the Munter hitch. I think of five broad categories of uses, and using it well can have some subtleties depending upon our circumstances. But let's start with tying the Munter, which can be done lots of ways. I'm going to show three so that we can have a conversation about how the hitch functions, along with some of the pros and cons of the different choices we can make when even just orienting the hitch. For the first tying method, we could make it in a loaded position, as if there was an immovable weight on the load strand. If we assume that I am wanting to stand on the brake side, and I want the load on the other side, I can put a half twist in the rope with the brake strand behind the load strand. Then I can cross the brake strand, across the load strand again, and finally clip the brake strand through by moving from the brake strand side to the load strand side. Now let's look at a few universal truths about the hitch that will be true no matter how we tie it. As the load weights the hitch, the load strand is through the tongue of the hitch. This would be the orientation of the hitch if we were, say, lowering a climber. But if the climber was moving up, I would have more pressure on the brake strand than the load strand, and the hitch would flip with the brake strand now running through the tongue instead. That is part of why we usually prefer to tie this hitch on a pear-shaped HMS carabiner. The hitch both takes up some space on the working end and needs the space to flip. We can make a munter on a D carabiner, but it will bite a lot more. Also note that the braking position on the munter is when the brake strand and load strand are in parallel and going in the same direction, which is different than most belay devices where usually the brake position is with the strands going in opposite directions. Now though, let's look at something specific to how we tied this particular munter hitch. Notice that as compared to the brake strand, the load strand is on the spine side of the carabiner, meaning the brake strand is on the gate side. The upsides of having the load on the spine side is that the carabiner is strongest on the spine. For instance, recently Petzl did a study in which they loaded a carabiner with other equipment and then had the chief load happen near the gate. They noted the carabiners would only hold about 30% of the carabiner's full strength, so down to 6 or 7 kilonewtons from the mid-20s. Now, 6 or 7 kilonewtons is still a load that could be hard to create at a belay or lowering point, and a munter is not producing the same crowding as the test, but it is also relatively easy to ensure the load is on the spine side. Another potential upside is if we want to be able to get the brake strand in and out of the carabiner without unclipping the rope entirely. Say if we were doing multiple lowers and want to pull the rope back up after the first lower and want to get the end up for tying in for the second lower. But there is also a downside to the brake strand being gate side, and that's simply that the brake strand can be moving across the gate, potentially wearing the rope sheath or even potentially unscrewing a screw gate. Taking these pros and cons with an appropriate measure of calm, Richard Delaney calls out this concern about the brake strand running across the gate, while also noting we can mitigate this risk by keeping our braking hand in position to avoid that bad rope position. Here's another subtlety. Notice I put a half twist with the brake strand behind as the first move. What if we didn't? Well, we can still drag the brake strand across and behind the load strand, though that's all now happening on the other side of the carabiner, and then clip through, moving from brake side to load side like before. But now there is a cross below the hitch. Maybe a problem. Maybe not. But a consideration. So on to another example of tying the munter. 
In this instance, we clip through without any twist. Next, we take the load strand and make a half twist, then we add one more quarter turn in the same direction as we clip this loop. This time we end up with the load on the gate side rather than the spine side. So, we've reversed the trade-offs we just discussed. And further, we've needed slack in the load strand in order to tie it this way. And then the third method. We can tie the hitch in the air. We need two half twists with the vertical strands on opposite sides of the horizontal strand. Now we close the doors together and clip through where we close those doors. Notice we can clip through with either strand on spine side so we can achieve either orientation this way. But again, we need slack in the system to tie it. Bearing in mind these minor and manageable trade-offs, but trade-offs nonetheless, we can take a look at those five broad uses of the Munter hitch. See why we might choose one orientation of the hitch over another, and in total, see why this is such a good hitch to know how to use. First, we can use a munter as the base of a combination knot that can tie off a rope or cord, but still allow it to be releasable under load. This is pretty standard practice in many rescue scenarios. For example, the standard AMGA practice around escaping a belay from the top uses two munter mule knots. First, after going hands-free, we create our first munter mule with some cord. After the munter, we put a half twist in the brake strand, as we are treating both strands as a single line, and then run a bite around all the strands before running it through our half twist. Now with long tails, we can just run the tails through the remaining bite, or alternatively, with short tails, we can use the bite itself to tie an overhand stopper. Now we need to add a backup to this piece of cord. So we take the brake strand of the rope and add in another munter mule with an overhand stopper. Now, as we take out the device, we have a cord holding the climber and a more robust rope as a backup. With the device out of the way, we can now take the slack out of the rope. That means undoing the overhand and mule, pulling out the slack with the munter, and then redoing the system with the mule and overhand knots. So by being releasable, we never took the rope off belay, if you will, as a backup to the cord. Now, again, the releasability comes into play as we can get the cord back down to its munter-only configuration and lower the load from the cord to the rope. So, generalizing, anytime we want to tie off a rope but have the ability to hold tension on that rope, the munter is a great option. To that end, notice when tying these munters, I was using the first tying method. Having the load on the strongest spine side in a safety situation makes a lot of sense. Also, because the anchor is above us, we never have the brake strand crossing up and across the gate, so that issue doesn't really come into play. Another use case then also has the anchor above us. We could just belay from the top. Maybe we dropped a belay device. Maybe it's a really short pitch. Maybe we hurt our elbow and need a smoother belay. In this case, I am also using the first tying method. Again, the brake strand will not move upward and over the gate, so the added small benefit of having the load strand on the strongest part of the carabiner doesn't really cost me anything. Again, generalizing, anything we need to quote unquote haul that doesn't require mechanical advantage, like a climber moving under their own power, or maybe we need to take our pack off to get through a chimney or something, could be done from this setup. From the same setup, we can lower a climber, supplies, whatever. This time though, if we have anything heavy, like a person on the end, we want to make sure to add a friction hitch back up to the brake strand. Now we get one of the smoothest lowers of any lowering option. We have another video on different lowering options that use a plaquette device if you are interested in some of the alternatives. A common theme then is when the brake strand will stay oriented the same direction as the load strand. That is, there is no reason for the brake strand to cross the carabiner and potentially come into contact with the gate. We see a lot of professional guides and instructors having the load strand on the spine side. Ryan Tilly in a rescue drill, JB Mountain Skills belaying from the top, the German guides at Ortovox Safety Academy, Mark Chauvin and Rob Capolillo in the Mountain Guide Manual, here using an auto locking munter. And you can watch a whole video we did on auto locking hitches, which includes this one as among the three discussed. But things change when we start belaying from below, or from the harness, the fourth category of uses. We will typically see a munter used in two broadly defined circumstances. We see it on low angle terrain with lower fall forces, either on snow or scrambly routes. Or we see it in fixed point belays, which is a topic that demands so much depth, I won't go into it much here. 
Suffice it to say, we actually want to avoid an immediate bite at the belay, like a brake-assisted device would deliver, so the munter is a good option. Regardless of which use, we are now in a circumstance where the brake strand can go back across the gate of the carabiner as we let out slack. So if belaying from the harness, we will see many circumstances of setting up the hitch with the brake strand on the spine side, such as this AMGA instructional video, and the same German guides who had the brake strand on the gate side when working from an anchor above. Even Freedom of the Hills has an illustration with a spine side brake. If we look at fixed point belays, the German Alpine Club, when showing their preferred methods, show the brake strand spine side. So does AMGA guide and researcher at Weber State University, Derek De Bruin. Here's AMGA guide Ryan Tilly again. But the NSA in France, the organization that trains guides there, will show both brake strand orientations. Could the flip in weird vectors of a fall drag the brake strand over the gate when the brake strand is on the gate side? Well, you start to see professionals tilting towards mitigating against that risk, despite the small trade-off of having the fall force loading closer to the gate. Which takes us to our fifth type of use, repelling or abseiling if we have lost our device. In this case, a few things change from our usual repel setup. First, we won't typically see the munter extended away from our harness, as we can exacerbate the twisting we get in the ropes, which can also twist our extension. Plus, we would want to avoid the potential for the rope to rub across the extension as well. So now we have a problem getting a friction hitch back up on our setup. In the old days, people would add a friction hitch from their leg loop. But then if we should raise our leg, we can get the friction hitch stuck in the rappel device or hitch. So instead, we can extend around our waist and add the friction hitch back up at our hip. With the munter, we will notice not as much friction as we are used to with a device. And while all applications of a munter twist the rope, it is particularly bad with the rope tension of a rappel. So we could use a super munter. The major issue with the super munter is that it produces a lot of friction, so much so that I can really only use it for purely vertical to overhanging routes. It does have the benefit of reducing the twists we get in the rope though, as the two opposite twists in the construction negate each other. Of all the five categories of uses in this video, rappelling is the one where I care about the brake strands and the gate the most, because the entire system is under tension. The brake strand has to go the opposite direction of the load strand, so across the carabiner, and the rope could twist in the direction that would unscrew a gate if I had the brake gate side. So while imperfect, that is why we invented belay devices and other tools after all, the munter hitch is nonetheless so versatile that I think of many of its potential uses as required knowledge. Have you used the munter hitch? Let us know how in the comments. Thanks for watching this video. Please like, subscribe, and share if you want to support us. For more information, you can go to our website at www.shortguysbetaworks.com. If you like this video, you can check out last week's video on three auto-locking hitches, or you can check out our entire rock climbing safety series. We'll see you next week and keep on getting more out of that big outside.